uh, Siddharth Gandhi going through those segments in their fireside chat. Let's now transition to the initial uh, fireside chat of the day featuring Grant Thornton, where we delve into demystifying AI risks and enablers for India's decade. I'm honored to present the distinguished panel of speakers who will be leading this session. We have Rohit Das, partner, cyber and IT risk, and Rama Vedashri, advisor, Dallas Venture Capital, and former CEO, DSCI. Over to both of you for this session. for joining us at AISS and also Grant Thornton's support to the conference and many other initiatives that we do. Absolutely. Thank you, Aditya, Jatin, and the DSCI team for having me here. Always a pleasure. And uh, kudos to the entire team on the rich agenda and the uh, you know, galaxy of speakers that they've managed to rope in. So we have about 20 minutes. And uh, Rohit, uh, you have 18 plus years experience all of it in cyber, if I'm not wrong. And uh, also very impressive that you have worked across sectors, including manufacturing and public sector, other than the mainstream commercial enterprise sectors. Always kudos to anyone who's worked across commercial plus public sector. It's not very easy, particularly in the cyberspace. But uh, in your entire work, X, what caught my attention is uh, you know, one of your expertise areas is third-party risk management and vendor assessment. And increasingly in the last, you know, two, three years, this third-party risk, um, you know, is a big menace um, hanging on the top of the head of every CTO, CIO, and CISO, right? Yeah. So, uh, what have you seen as challenges when uh, your enterprise customers, including public sector, for example, uh, deploy any new or emerging technology, including whether it is now the AI ML solutions or moving, uh, you know, anything cloud-based, uh, what are the challenges you see when the enterprises evaluate any emerging technology? Sure. First of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm um, completely humbled and honored uh, to be having this uh, conversation fireside chat uh, along with Rama, who's again an industry leader. Um, so, yeah, so picking the cue uh, from what you mentioned, uh, Rama, so uh, when it comes to any new technology stack uh, that any organization is sort of looking at, uh, building in their uh, ecosystem. I think the first and foremost aspect that would come uh, into mind of a CIO or a CISO would be first to understand how this new technology stack is going to sort of fit into your overall architecture, blueprint, and uh, the overall functional aspects. Right. So I think that's the first aspect. The um, If I were a CIO or a CISO, I would first think, how is, how is this new architecture to be architecture going to pan out? Uh, subsequent to, uh, to that would be to understand how this, uh, you know, the security elements will pan out, how the flow of data uh, from one system one system to another, and this uh, new technology stack is also eventually going to have multiple APIs and other components, which is going to talk to multiple other systems uh, within the organizations. Henceforth, it is important to look at the integration complexities as well. Right, uh, not to forget the regulatory nuances, uh, you know, which may have or uh, it may sort of uh, incur. Um, let's say if I'm a regulated industry like an NBFC or a, you know, fund house or a bank, um, I have obligation to an RBI. Certain cases, if I am an intermediary, I have an obligation to a SEBI. So in such situations, depending on the regulatory nuances, I have to have an eye towards how am I complying with this new technology stack towards those regulatory aspects? So it is going to have all of these elements that I talked about, um, but how does it eventually pan out is to have a proper due diligence mechanism uh, to assess this uh, you know, new technology stack. Uh, two elements to it, first is the um, assessment of the vendor or the third party or the business partner who's providing the solution. Uh, or customizing the solution. Second element is to have a impact assessment 
of this entire activity to be carried out. Um, impact assessment can also have multiple folds to it. First is the security angle, third, second is the functionality angle, uh, the business logic, and third is the privacy angle, which is like, again becoming far more prominent uh, as we are in the decade of implementing DPDPA in the country. So I think those were the elements that I felt would be pretty important to consider. So great uh, insights, Rohit. Let's build a little bit on this. Uh, increasingly, we see CTOs and CIOs, you know, ramping up on leveraging AI in the core business solutions. I'm not talking about AI-enabled uh, security solutions, which I think is a different, um, uh, you know, ball game. I'm talking about core AI ML-based solutions, whether it is in healthcare, pharma, financial services, of course, in manufacturing, in all of that. And a lot of critical workloads migrating to public cloud, right? And in the previous uh, plenary, there was a lot of discussion around the cloud too. So in this kind of an environment, what would be your uh, guidance to enterprises and businesses, including public sector entities, on uh, how do they ramp up their deployment and evaluation ecosystem? Because we put... There's a lot, much, a lot of focus on the provider ecosystem, but I think uh, we need to match up the uh, deployment ecosystem, which includes the actual enterprise customer with, you know, organizations like yours and the services organizations which support uh, customers. What do we need to ramp them up so that when they are deploying core business solutions which are AI ML enabled? or migrating to public cloud, just as two examples, it could be anything else in any of the emerging technology stacks. What would be your guidance? Sure. No, no, I think a very pertinent question, uh, Rama, there. Um, I would really uh, look at it from a top-down perspective, first of all, because if you are migrating to a, uh, a new workload to the cloud, or uh, sort of build a new uh, stack from uh, you know that standpoint, uh, what one should eventually look at is the entire migration as a framework or how it is going to pan out, right? Uh, and then uh, we also have to look at the cloud security policy which sort of defines in the organization. While there is a provider, there is a deployer, uh, one should also be cognizant of the shared responsibility model uh, which uh, which is, has to be uh, very clearly established. Uh, Often, most of the times, the uh, the responsibilities are clear, but however, the activities within the responsibilities are not very clear, uh, which is a common problem that most of the uh, you know deployer and uh, you know provider sort of face. Uh, in a typical shared responsibility model, one may want to consider about workload allocation. One may want to look at the tenancy related aspects, configuration related aspects, access management, patch management, network security, and most importantly, the incident response related activity considering the, uh, the increasing cyber attack. So all of those elements uh, needs to be looked at in quite a lot of detail one, when one sort of establishes a shared responsibility model. Um, uh, while a shared responsibility model exists, you also have to have very clear-cut SLAs and KPIs to be defined, uh, which needs to be further monitored on a type-to-type -type basis. I think so those elements will play a critical role while you're sort of uh, you know, uh, allocating a workload to the cloud. So I'm glad you brought out this uh, shared responsibility concept, which is talked a lot about in the cloud environment. But increasingly, when we look at AI ML models, there's a lot of uh, responsibility that has to happen in the deployment uh, organization because those models have to be monitored for life. It's not just at the development phase. We need to look at the way they get trained after deployment with the data and the, if the data is you know, um, uh, inclusive enough. So there's a lot that needs to happen. So increasingly, we are waking up to this concept of shared responsibility, not only in the cloud milieu, but also for a lot of AIML uh, stack that's getting deployed for business solutions. Uh, now, when we look at, um, you know, I mean, I'm glad you agree with me that AI is getting mainstreamed across verticals. Uh, we have now uh, woken up in 2023 to the power of la large language models. Yeah. We are g beginning to see LLS by the security platform companies, right? We have seen a lot of the big tech companies announce LLM platform stacks on which services and the startup ecosystem are uh, leveraging. Uh, but uh, governments worldwide, particularly given the threat actors of 
state or state affiliated threat actors we are waking up uh, to uh, the problems or the menace of dual use of ai right and uh, when you talk about dual use the weaponization of ai and including including when we look at all the new league of attacks that we are targeted at as a very growing economy uh, one of the largest digital hubs of the world so what are your thoughts on how do we mitigate these risks in terms of you know principles like model security we're dealing with challenges of synthetic data could be a problem yes. in the way the models are trained or poisoning of data particularly in healthcare use cases so what are your insights on how do you mitigate while we will harness ai what do what should enterprises do to mitigate yeah so um, you know i will just start my response by uh, borrowing a quote uh, from an ai pioneer uh, oren uh, he says that ai is a tool the choice of how it gets deployed is ours right uh, and very pertinent in the current times uh, when we are really uh, you know building ai as one of our tools to uh, move forward as an economy or a, you know uh, have thrive as an economy in the decade that uh, shri narendra modi already Uh, sort of has announced um and one of the added element is uh, we've recently uh, in the gpai summit uh, prime minister also talked about uh, how generative ai is going to play a critical role in the overall digital transformation of the country and that uh, you know around 1.5 trillion dollar um, contribution to the gdp will be done by generative ai it's a huge magnanimous number which he is talking about which is all going to cost because of generative ai and uh, with uh, chat gpts krithrims and all around the corner they also say english is the new programming language right Sorry. so english is the new programming language so it's as simple as you can develop a program by just saying or talking or typing in chat gpt with bashini being talked about indian yeah. languages are also the new yeah, yeah, yeah. so um so i think you know from uh, picking uh, from there uh, there are two three elements that i also want to touch upon when i talk about ai uh, ai uh, as per the oecd which sort of uh, defines the ai principles it talks about inclusivity it talks about sustainability it talks about human angle and of course the fairness aspects transparency explainability and also robustness safety security and accountability some of these key elements which is very clearly brought out in the oecd uh, uh, you know guideline for ai principles um there are two sides of it we already talked about you know there is a positive side there is a negative side when you talk about positives uh, we always have lot of elements um you know especially when it comes to um uh, healthcare as a sector you did mention about healthcare space research healthcare you know uh, uh, as recent as i think two weeks back um there is an application uh, ai uh, model which is developed by um uh, which which is called cure ai essentially it helps in detecting a uh, detecting tuberculosis without by just the x ray scan uh, it doesn't need a reader or anything of that sort nor a doctor it sort of picks up the pattern understands it and mentions it and similarly apollo hospital has launched pro health uh, based on the uh, you know uh, reports medical history and things like that it can sort of predict what kind of risk the the person can cause so we are doing good amount of work when it comes to positives uh, space research is again a classic example uh, soft landing of chandrayaan 3 was only possible because of ai right so uh, enough and, and coming from a cyber background myself i should not miss out on talking about the the predictive threat intelligence which can be of great use to national security certain is doing an amazing job you know uh, with collecting various data points and then uh, picking it up uh, ministry of it as recent as last year has launched bashini app which is a language based ai ai based uh, you know language app which talks about which gives any citizen to transact with another person in 22 different languages so it's an amazing journey that we are in um, at the same time we have a split side to it we have issues related with deep fakes we have impersonation impersonation attacks social engineering attacks election manipulations all of these are possibilities of the the, the split side of the coin right so yeah i think those are the things i broadly wanted to bring to your uh, note 
it's a great uh, insights from you, Rohit, on uh, you know what should the deployment system be aware of. But I would say if you look at all the new AI uh, principles that have emerged, you, you rightfully talked about the OECD principles. The NIST framework is very aligned with the OECD principles. Uh, but most of them are focusing on the provider ecosystem, rightfully focusing on the provider ecosystem. Because even NIST framework is more at uh, operationalization of the principles by the providers. I think we now need a lot more guidance on how do you operationalize these frameworks in the deployment ecosystem. I think it's very easy to say you uh, tell an enterprise CIO or CISO that you need to do a bias audit. Right. I mean, but what are those tools and frameworks to do a bias audit? Right. Or any one of them, how do you monitor for uh, security vulnerabilities in an ML algorithm because they're for the End user, it is almost like um, it's almost like a black box. Correct. Similarly, you you talked about human autonomy, right? How do you build that human autonomy without compromising on the robustness of the AI solution, Correct. so that even in a SOC environment or in a hospital environment, the uh, the real practitioners and experts can take that human decision in case you know the yeah. outcome from the AI system. So there's a lot that needs to be done while. Uh, it is, uh, you're right that a lot of principles have emerged and frameworks are coming and industry toolkits are coming. Uh, then I just wanted to, you know, building on top of AI, the new menace that governments and businesses and maybe individuals like you and me, maybe not so much me and you because we are not really celebrities, right? Uh, we are uh, dealing with this entire menace of deep fakes. My worry is, one is the harm that it can cause to individuals, right? Uh, particularly a lot of women and children could be targets of that. We are seeing celebrities being already targets of that. But my biggest worry is when you look at the state actors and state affiliated actors, uh, the way deep fakes can be used as a cyber influence threat, right? Because uh, ultimately, what is a cyber influence operation trying to do? It's trying to discredit either a country, country's leader, or an industry sector, or targeting a particular sector or a business, right? And deep fakes have that challenge. So would you like to, uh, you know, probably look at, we are still early stages of mitigating right. that risk. Uh, do you have some insights? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, deep fakes, um, as recent, uh, it's a buzzword these days um, and when from a uh, statistical standpoint, uh, India is the second largest contributor to deep fake uh, pornography um, in terms of the traffic. Uh, it's a startling fact and it's disturbing as well. At the same time, uh, if, if that is happening, uh, there are 42 user-friendly applications which um, which is downloadable in an app store or a you know play store for that matter, um, which uh, and it's highly user friendly to that extent that anyone can do anything. So if such uh, convenience is there right in the hands of anyone uh, in your mobile phone, I think we are um, we are to have good amount of governance mechanism. Uh, right now, um, the the live examples of deep fake has been. You know, celebrities including Rashmika Mandana, including uh, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi himself, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian Prime Minister, and the list is endless, Elon Musk, so on and so forth. So uh, I would just want to put a hypothetical, hypothetical scenario, right? So uh, we very distinctly remember 24th of March 2020, when Sri Narendra Modi came into the news and declared it as a national lockdown. Just imagine that to happen with a deep fake system or an application. Though a lot of us are in this room are aware of the, uh, you know, or maybe even detect that it's a fake video, but there are a good amount of folks who are still illiterate or may, may not be, uh, you know, understanding the ramifications of that to that extent. So it, it, it has the potential to cause good amount of harm. 
um, you know, so I think uh, those are my views. Good amount of, uh, you know, frameworks and other things needs to be done. Maybe if I can just take an, uh, because I, I want to use this opportunity to also uh, ask a question back to you, Rama, because, uh, you know, you have deep experience in, uh, you know, leading large organizations. What are your views on how these large tech giants are sort of taking the, uh, you know, uh, AI into their, uh, in, into their day to day operations? If you can just give some examples, that'd be great. So usually guests are not supposed to ask the host the question, but I will answer it. Okay. So I would say like, you know, last 10, 12 years of my tenure, I was in industry bodies like NASCOM and DSCI. Uh, the focus initially is always about evangelizing the new technology and at a country level building capability, right? So initially the focus was on how do you get AI ecosystem nurtured in India. That's why NASCOM first built this uh, AI center of excellence both in Bangalore and in uh, NCR. Uh, similarly, DSCI looked at how can AI be leveraged by the security startups ecosystem and building those research reports to showcase the new u u innovation uh, ecosystem and what use cases and problems have they solved in fintech, in healthcare, or in cybersecurity. So most of the initial research reports were always about showcasing AI and evangelize it with end users. Uh, that was one of the focus, talent development, working with Ministry of IT to build that talent pool, so the AI and data sciences skills development, uh, along with the cybersecurity skills development. You will notice now some of the IITs, like IIT Chennai recently, spun off AI and data sciences as a separate department from computer science. Yeah. So we are now going to see BTEC, MTECs in AI data sciences. So a lot of that is that role. But as the technology gets developed, we wake up to the risks of it. For example, DSCI, uh, very early, almost three, four years back, we built a, a guidance and toolkit for solution developers on ethics and privacy of AI. And now, if I'm not wrong, it's an online curriculum, right? right? Some of the large industry members, I mean, I've had an opportunity to work in GE and Microsoft before uh, joining NASCOM. Uh, I think GE has done a lot with AI in their healthcare and energy practice yeah. or uh, water. Um, Microsoft has done a lot with AI and the large language models and the security stacks and other industry members. But when it comes to organizations like NASCOM and DSCI, we look at what is the long-term potential of uh, emerging technology to grow India as a digital hub and focus on skills and development. And then comes the regulatory advocacy. Now we are doing a lot of work around responsible trustworthy. Sure. Great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. I think we are... So time is up. Yeah. But, you know, I can't let somebody like Rohit, who's engaged with so many customers, uh, without making a promise on stage. I won't put you on a spot, hopefully, uh, because, you know, you all have so much influence on customers, right? Uh, you and your peer organizations. So um, I want to promise from you that during lunch break or before or after, you'll walk, it, walk through the expo okay. and understand the new solutions that are coming with the, from the startups and the young product companies yeah. and see where, whom you can recommend them to customers. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Is that, a promise? that is a promise. That is a promise. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Shreya. Thank you. We have tokens of our appreciation coming out to both of you.